Today, I'm going to show you how to use PixInsight to turn these two images into this. What's going on, my fellow astrophotographer guys and gals? Today, I'm going to show you my workflow in PixInsight using my image of M104, the Sombrero Galaxy. For this image, I used two sets of data, one from a one-shot color camera and another set of data from a mono camera. Now, my last video covers the how and the why that I used two different cameras to get this data. So if you haven't seen that video yet, you can watch it right here. I've also included a link to download both the RGB and the Luminance RAW stacked files in the description below if you wanna download them so you can follow along during the tutorial. Okay, so let's get started. Don't forget you can go download both of these raw stacked image files in the link in the description below. So once you've downloaded those and opened them up, uh, let's take a look at both of these a little bit. So the first image that I did right here, um, I captured this using my Celestron 9.25 inch telescope with the ASI 533 MC Pro one shot color camera. Now that set up images really, really fast. So I was able to gather a lot of a lot of data. However, the seeing was was not optimal and um, I wasn't really happy with some of the resolution. I mean, the pixels on that, I think they're 3.8 size pixels. The other uh, data that I acquired here was done using my apochromatic telescope four and a half inch refractor with my ASI 183 monochrome camera. And if you uh, look, as we can tell here, zooming in, the smaller 2.4 micron size pixels gives a much better, much better detail. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the RGB data for our color, and we're gonna use the monochrome data, the luminance data for our luminance frame. And we're gonna combine them using the LRGB combination. Uh, we're not going to do that just yet. That's going to be later on. We've got some processing to do before we can get to that point. The first thing I need to do is I need to flip this image so that it matches uh, the Sombrero Galaxy over here. So let's go ahead, click the, uh, go to image and go to geometry. What we're going to do is a vertical mirror here. So I've matched the orientation of the RGB data but these are still not aligned images. Typically, you know, when you stack your images um, in PixInsight, whether like if you're using um, WBPP, it will um, not only register the images, it calibrates and registers them so that they all match and, and they can then be integrated. Uh, but these were stacked separately, so now I have to match them. Uh, you could try, if you're doing something like this, you could try the star alignment. Sometimes that works. But if for some reason it keeps failing, um, there's another process that we can use called the dynamic alignment process. So let's go ahead and open that up. You might, you might be wondering, why does this look so horrible with the black on the sides here? It's because my OAG, my off-axis guider, the stock of that was sticking up in front of the sensor, I was, I'm having a hard time getting that adjusted, so um, that'll have to be something I'll figure out later. Something else of note, um, you, could, you can tell that I've got some uh, dust motes here on the sensor, and I've even got a little bit of amp glow, which the one ASI183 is, is notable for. I did not use darks, I did not use flats, I was not able to get those. So that's not a problem though. This would be a great example of how we can kind of fix some of those uh, issues as well. So let's go ahead and get started with the dynamic alignment. Now, you're going to want to select your first image and your second. Uh, the second image will be aligned to match the first image. So. I want to keep the native resolution of this one, and so that'll be my main image here. So we'll select that as number one, and we'll select this RGB data as our in number two image. So the first thing, we've selected our two images here. We need to select a star on the first one. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna try to match where it thinks the star is in the other image, and this is obviously not close. So we're gonna manually move this to the star that corresponds. And we just keep doing that. Uh, after the second or third star, it will begin to recognize where 
these points should be aligned. So let's go ahead and move this one right here to that corresponding star. Now let's see if it if it uh, does what it's supposed to do. Let's select this one here. Yep. So even after the second star, it's it's matching uh, when I select on the first one. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to select a few stars. Um, I don't know, about 15 or 20. And then we can go ahead and get the process to go. Now you want to select a few stars, you know, um, kind of spread out so it has a good basis to go off of. All right, I think that should probably be good enough. Okay, so let's go ahead and hit the check mark, the check mark, the execute button, and see what happens. Okay, it's made a new image. Let's go ahead and stretch that. I'm going to go ahead and minimize this for now. And let's see if these guys match like they're supposed to. Maximize that, drag it over here. Yep, matches up really nice. So that's the dynamic alignment. And now we can begin um, the next step, which is the dynamic crop. We gotta crop these guys, get rid of all that other stuff that we don't want. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and crop with this one. So this is the one that has all this major vignetting and issues here. We can get a, a better idea of, of what we want the crop to look like by cropping this one first. So let's go ahead and open up dynamic crop. Oh, I guess I have to close that. Anything that's uh, any process that is a dynamic process in, in PixInsight, um, you can't have more than one dynamic process open at a time. PixInsight says that they are going to try to make it where that's not an issue in future updates but i'm not sure when that's going to be tackled so we're going to go ahead and and close that then we can open up dynamic crop all right so click that and hit the reset button um i like to zoom out a little bit here so i can see what i'm doing and we're just going to bring this guy in like i said we're going to make this kind of small to try to avoid some of that vignetting over there what I'll probably do is make it more of a square. So we've got an idea of the size. We can come over here. Uh, the width is 2880. Um, let's actually match it to the height, 2336. Let's make it a nice 2400. And make the width of 2400. There we go. I'd say that looks fairly good enough to me. Okay, another thing, uh, another reason why I think maybe it'd be helpful to do this, um, the ASI uh, 183 images are fairly large. So if you've got a computer that you're working with that's somewhat slow, um, it's going to be a lot easier on your computer to have a, a, a lot smaller area to work with. So let's go ahead and hit the check button. Now, how do I match the crop from this to this? I'll show you how. We can go right click on the tab right here, integration, load our history explorer, and I can take and click the dynamic crop and drag it to the top of the desktop right there. And so what it's done is it's created an icon with that exact um, the exact dimensions of the crop. And all I gotta do is click and drag it to this and it will crop it exactly the same way. All right, um, what I like to do is have these set up. We're not gonna need this one anymore. This was the original one that we did the dynamic alignment. And I'm not gonna need this crop anymore either. So I can delete that. Okay, let's maximize these. And I'll let you see how they match up. There we go. All right, so the next thing that we need to do is the dynamic background extraction, or otherwise known as DBE. 
DBE, um, dynamic back extraction, can be frustrating. I, I really find probably the most, the two most time-consuming, frustrating processes for me to use in Pix and Sight is probably dynamic background extraction and deconvolution. Um, and I think that many people also are probably challenged with those more than anything else because they require the most experimentation to get it right. Now, for the image that I had in the last video, I've already processed this. I'm actually going through this again with you. But uh, so I, I do kind of have an idea of what's going to work best for this. So I'll, I'll explain it, try to try to move through it quickly, but also explain to you what I'm doing. So we've got the DBE open, we need to hit the reset button. So now let's pick some points here. Let me look at my generation size. So the default sample radius is five. Um, I could probably go up to size 15 here. Resize all, there we go. And let's take a click and see. Yeah, that looks like a good size. There's several different methods that people use. Some people like to actually just do samples per row and hit generate. And I do find sometimes that works for some images. This particular one, um, which is what I do with many of my images, is I just put a sample in each corner here. And then I put one a little bit of the ways up. And you want to make sure that you avoid stars, um, not putting it directly on stars, but also even if it's a really bright star, such as this one here, you don't want to get too close to it either. Okay, um, actually let's take this one and move it in just a bit. Alright, I think that looks mostly good. Tolerance. Um, tolerance is and shadows relaxation what these two things do it shows you how many of the pixels are rejected depending on how bright they are or how dark they are so if you watch in the right hand corner here when as i change this you can see what it's going to do uh, the pixel that is selected is this green one here so right now uh, let's change it up to oh let's go really high at five okay so you can tell that most of the bright pixels are being allowed to be sampled. Now, some of these darker pixels, if we want to sample more of those, we can also increase the shadows relaxation. Let's put that up really high at eight. So now you can tell that it's sampling a lot more. This is just something that you're gonna have to experiment. It really depends on your camera. It depends on the length of your exposures. It depends on the gain. Uh, that you're using, or if you're using a DSLR, the, the ISO that you have set. These are just something that you're going to have to experiment a little bit with. I actually typically like to use around Tolerance 5 and uh, uh, kind of keep the shadows relaxation at about 3, but in this particular photo, I found that uh, a 1.5 tolerance there and a shadows relaxation of 5 worked really well. Smoothing factor. What that means is for these particular points, how much is it going to change the balance of the photo between these points? At a smaller number, that means it's only going to correct in a smaller area. So you'll see a more the correction to be a lot tighter around these sample points. But if we raise it up, I mean the maximum is 1 on this it's going to smooth the transitions between these points a lot more. And once again, that's one of those things that you're just going to have to experiment with. I found that in this photo, smoothing factor of one uh, seemed to work fairly well. All right, let's close that out and look at our target image correction. I use division almost all of the time because I don't deal with a whole lot of, of light pollution. A lot of mine is vignetting from my optics. So I click normalize because I adjust the background neutralization with the background neutralization tool later on. Let's go ahead and click execute here. Let me close this up so you can see the bottom of this. And let's take a look. This will be our background model. It's sometimes helpful to look at this so that we can see how things are looking. 
let's go ahead and do that now if it looks wavy like this sometimes it helps to click the um, 24 bit lookup tables option here so there we go it's a lot smoother now if I transfer back and forth whoops so clicking back and forth we can try to see if it seems to match up on some of these colors honestly to my eye in this lower right corner it looks a bit too green whereas this looks purple so I'm not sure if that's a good match or not but let's look at the actual generated image that is supposed to be corrected and stretch that and take a look and see how it looks yeah, it looks okay honestly um, one of the weird things too you gotta understand it's uh, when it does this and then you hit the screen transfer button on this sometimes it'll actually stretch it even more than the original image and it can make it look even more grainy so if you want it to be stretched the same exact way as this image what you do is you click on this drag the triangle icon to your desktop here okay we'll switch back and instead of stretching it with this, I'm actually going to drag this onto that. And so now it's stretched the same exact way as the original image. And honestly, when I go back and forth, you can tell that it has majorly corrected this photo. There's still a little bit of a, of a transition here, but for sake of time, I'm not going to get too detailed. This, this is one of these things... Uh, you know, I do kind of want to take a moment to explain that uh, processing is so, so, so important. It doesn't matter how much money you have invested in gear. No amount of gear is going to completely make your photos better. Yeah, it certainly helps to have to have good gear, but um, people with with inexpensive gear, I mean, you could you could take a, a DSLR and a Star Tracker, and somebody with really really good refined processing skills can make a better looking photo than someone who has five thousand dollars worth of gear processing is so important so like with my images it, it takes me hours to get them and, and fine-tune them just the way that i like them uh, for sake of this video i'm not going to be making that video this long but it's good to understand that so with when you do your stuff be patient and take time to experiment where you're like with DBE where you're putting your points and experiment with your parameters your tolerance your shadows relaxation your smoothing factor to get it just right I think this looks fairly well so what I'm gonna do is on this I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and close out whoops that's the wrong button I this Apple computer has this weird little button that I hit sometimes and it brings up these uh, emoticons and stuff so that might happen again before the end of the video i'm sorry if it does um, i'm going to go ahead and close the actual the dbe um, you know i'm going to do one thing here in a minute but um, i'm going to close this window because what we're going to do is apply it directly to by replacing the image that way we keep it in our history log and we're going to hit the execute button so now it's applied it to that image and it is now kept in the history should we need to go back um, now one thing I'm gonna do this is something you can do sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't I'm gonna take this new instance and drag it just like we did before so we can actually access the same exact settings I'm gonna close this out and I hate this stupid long name so I'm gonna double click that and just rename this RGB and actually while I'm at it I'm gonna go ahead and name this loom that way for luminance that way I know which is which and I don't have this long thing dragging down there okay so we've done the dynamic background extraction on that and I'm pretty happy with it uh, that's our background model we can close that now let's apply it to our luminance data so what I was saying sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't you can actually uh, try using the same exact uh, dynamic background extraction on the RGB and use it on the luminance let's just see if it works now uh, I'm gonna uncheck replace target image simply because for now I don't want it to do that I just want to see what the actual model looks like here match it up and stretch it out 
Let's go back and forth. So it looks to me like I've got a little bit too much of a striping here that I don't like. So here's what we're going to do. Let's go ahead and close this out. Let's move this in just a tad. Oh, well, for some reason, I have an extra data point there. And I'm not sure why. I don't know where that came from. I must have clicked on it by accident somewhere. So you can click on that. Uh, typically, you can hit, like with Windows, you can hit Delete. For some reason on my Mac, when I hit Delete, it doesn't do anything. So I actually have to come up here to the X and exit out. Okay, let's try this again and see what it looks like. I don't know if that will fix the issue. I'll show you how we can fix that later if the dynamic background doesn't fix it. <clears throat> and stretch it. Still having that issue. Alright, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to mess around with this for a bit and uh, when I get it kind of lined up and fixed, um, I'll be back and show you what I got. Okay, so I am back. This looks like a big giant mess. <laughs> Honestly, when I process this the first time, I don't remember doing this. Uh, it might be because it was cropped slightly differently. Not sure. But um, this is some pretty terrible vignetting. This is kind of a brute force, brute force, brute force method of fixing a problem like this when you have um, a major thing you're trying to, wanting to try to get rid of. Sometimes putting a lot of alignment points along those transitions. Um, can help. Another thing that I did was I raised the tolerance up to 5 and the shadows relaxation up to 8 and I changed my smoothing factor. This is probably the biggest change that I did as I forgot that it was at 1 which remember I told you when it's at 1 that's this uh, transition between the areas that it's um, fixing and balancing in the background is very very smooth. I want it to not be smooth around here. I want that transition to be much smaller. So when I set these up and change those, um, I'll show you what I got here. And I'm going to go ahead and just replace target image because I've already got it set the way that I like it. So there you go. Um, let's go ahead and close this out. So you can see that is much flatter looking, much better looking. So it's, it's pretty amazing when you take the time to use DBE and experiment with some of the settings and experiment with some of your sample points, you can actually fix some horrible vignetting with it. Okay, so we've got DBE finished. I'm going to go ahead and save these uh, icons over here. Actually, I probably don't need the screen stretch for now. Um, I'm going to, what we're going to do now is deconvolution. Deconvolution is a way um, that can help sharpen your image just a little bit. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it makes you want to pull your hair out and uh, bang your head against a wall because it's absolutely frustrating. So let's go ahead and open up deconvolution. All right, now Let's just get this out here in the open. I highly suggest that you do not use parametric PSF and that you do not use motion blur PSF, but you should use the external PSF. Um, there is what, I don't even remember what it was. It's been so long since I used it. Um, is it in the script? There is a way that you can get your PSF um, image by selecting different stars and doing all these measurements, but there's a script that makes it so much easier, um, which is the PSF image script. Oh, it's under uh, render. PSF image. This just make th makes things very, very simple. Now, if I'm going to be completely honest with you on this uh, PSF image creator, um, which was created by Hartmut Borneman. He's made a lot of great scripts for Pix and Sight. Um, I really am not sure. There's not any explanation for 
some of these settings and what's best under what scenarios. So I really am not sure how to guide you on that. Uh, and for this particular image, it seemed like an amplitude of 90 and a uh, amplitude minimum or maximum of 0.9 and minimum of 0 0.05. Sensitivity minus one, max 50. I usually, max 50 is usually what I have it on most of the time. But anyways, this seemed to be the best situation. Now you want to use Moffat one. Um, uh, these are going to be, these other options are going to be more specific to different sp uh, stars and, uh, uh, there's a big technical scientific explanation for all that stuff. Atom block, uh, if you really want to get super, super deep into an explanation, a mathematical explanation for how all this stuff works the way it does, he's a he's your go-to guy for that stuff. Um, me, I, you know, I like to understand a little bit of it, but most of the time I just want to, <laughs> I just want to be able to have a basic idea so that I can use it. So let's go ahead and do this. Evaluate. And uh, what it's going to do is it's going to ge generate basically a model of the average star in the image. And then in deconvolution is going to use that to help know how to correct the image. So this is the basic shape of my stars. And it says that it's kind of leaning in this direction. And so what we want to do is hit the create button. And it creates a... PSF image that we can then use for deconvolution. Now, this is something weird that I have not yet figured out with my Mac. Uh, it's relatively new to this. I'm on the MacBook M1 silicone. If you guys want me to do kind of a review for Pix and Sight with a benchmark, benchmark and all that for the new MacBooks M1 with silicone chip, let me know in the comments. I, I could certainly do a video. Anyways, uh, I'm used to PC. This is kind of weird, but okay, I got it right here. I found it. So this is the image of the star. And really, we don't need to do anything to that except just minimize it and store it over here for the time being. Now we go over to uh, open up your, your deconvolution um, process window again and click external PSF and click there and then we're going to under view select PSF so now we've got that model okay regularized Richardson Lucy uh, that is the standard for deconvolution there's other ones you can use um, but this is the best one from what I understand because it does the best at protecting the stars from getting um, completely messed up uh, I usually start with 10 iterations we want to do on of course on luminance this is luminance data here uh, we do want to select D-ringing, okay? And I do like to use a star mask, which we can put under local D-ringing. So we do need to make a star mask. So let's go ahead and go to process, go down to star mask. I will say this, if you do have, if you're working on PC or you're working on a older Mac before the silicone chip Macs, using Starnet++ is a, a really great way to make a mask. Um, I think it does a really good job. The new M1 Max with silicone, uh, Pix and Sight cannot use Starnet++. It actually causes the whole thing to crash. I don't know uh, why, but so you have to actually delete that module in order to use Pix and Sight. I'm sure that in the future it'll be fixed. For now, we're going to use the star mask. So I typically use two across the board there. I'm going to bring my midtones down to, for now, around 0.2. And this is going to be too high. But let's go ahead, let's just go ahead and, and click it. Uh, scale is five. Uh, once again, you're going to want to experiment with all these. A, a galaxy image is going to be different than a nebula image on some of those things. And also your, your pixel scale, your field of view, depending on how big or small your stars look, is going to affect how your star mask comes out. But let's just try this and see what happens. See what it looks like. All right, let's maximize it. Put it over here. And this is important that you do this when making a star mask. You look at this, you say, oh, those stars look good. But let's let's go ahead and stretch this. Yeah, that doesn't look so good, does it? That's horrible. So 
there's a lot of noise being counted as stars and it's because our noise threshold is too high. So let's trash that crap and let's pick a lower number. Let's go down to about 0.3. All right, let's see how this works. Okay, I'm still seeing quite a bit of noise in the background. So let's adjust it again. I'll be back in a minute when I get this fine tuned. Okay, uh, so this is the mask that I came up with. <laughs> funnily, funnily enough, I actually went the wrong way with the noise threshold. I went too low. I actually need to come up to 0.17. Uh, th weirdly, this is opposite than some of my other images. Anyways, so I've I've got uh, the mask here. Let's stretch it. You can see when we blink back and forth here that it's covering most of the big stars. We don't really need to worry too much about the little ones, um, but we've got most of the big ones covered. So um, now what we can do is let's minimize this, bring it over here and close out. Actually, I'm going to bring that back over here so you guys can see it. Open up deconvolution. Now let's load our view, which is our star mask. Okay. I like to start with the star mask low. We don't want to use it um, a whole lot if we don't have to. Now I can probably guarantee you that this uh, default global dark setting of 0.1 is probably going to be way too much. Can also guarantee you that uh, the wavelet regulars <laughs> regular regularization uh, is we probably need to add a couple more layers but you know what we're going to try this just like it is and see what happens but first <laughs> we need to make some previews because it's going to take forever um, so let's go ahead and make some previews um, you want to make previews over areas uh, that are dark um, background, mostly background. You want to make previews over areas that contain, um, if you're, of course, galaxy, but uh, over different areas of nebulosity. And since this crop is pretty small, I think making these previews just a little bit bigger is probably not going to be that big of a deal. So we'll do that. And then we're going to, let's see, let's make another preview around these big stars with background and see that works depending on your image you're gonna uh you might want to make more preview boxes all right let's start off with the galaxy and let's jump on this and see what happens actually it's really not too bad there oh see told you i would do it again boop okay let's see blinking back and forth on the preview you can see there is some ringing around our stars here and you can also see a little bit of webbing so adjusting our global dark and our global bright is going to help um, reduce some of those uh, artifacts so let's actually try reducing this down to 0 0.05 and just see what happens Yeah, our ringing is much worse. So let's try 1.5. <laughs> it's almost like I'm trying to type in an IP address. That's not going to work. There we go. Okay. All right. That looks, that's looking pretty good. Let's try to get rid of some of this, this. So... The global dark will help you get rid of the ringing around the stars. The global bright's going to help you get rid of some of this weird webbing looking noise here. Typically, with your global bright, about 10% of what global dark is um, will work. So if that's 0.15, let's make this 0.015. Ah. See, that's looking pretty good. Let's zoom in a bit here. Seeing just a bit of ringing around those stars slightly. Let's bring up our local amount to, let's try 45 and see what happens. Okay, 
and bring this global dark up just a bit to 0.16. Okay, um, let's do our, I usually like to use four wavelet layers on B3, Spleen 5, Gaussian. Um, experiment with those. Now, let's try bringing this up to about four, this to about three, this to about two. That's kind of a general area where I start. Uh, sometimes it might denoise. If you find that your image is actually not looking crisp anymore, it might just be because you've done too much on the wavelet regularization. So I usually do start off with like a 4, 3, 2, 1, and a 1, 7.5.35. Let's see what that looks like. All right. So, yeah, there's a little bit of noise. Um, and you can see that it's making the image just a little sharper. But now let's try bringing up our iterations even higher. The more iterations you can get while still maintaining an overall good-looking image, you're going to get that sharpening. So you can tell when I go back and forth, it's definitely looking sharper, but it's also making my stars um, have some of that, that black ringing. So let's bring this up to 0.8. Yeah, even higher. Let's go to point two. Okay, I'd say that overall looks pretty good. And you can tell that it's just adding the point. This is not a magic pill to, to give your image and make it just look um, amazing. It, it does, you want it to do just a little bit of sharpening without increasing the noise too much and without screwing up your stars. But let's uh, apply it to the other images here, the other previews, and make sure that it's not messing anything up over here. All right, overall, I think it looks okay. And let's go to preview three. Looks all right to me. So let's apply it to the whole image. A little trick here. Um, you can actually hide the previews just by undoing that show previews. Okay. And I'll be back. Well, you know what? Let's leave this up. I don't know if you've ever tried to run de or de deconvolution on your computer uh, at 20 iterations. Sometimes it takes a long time. Maybe this will give you an idea of how really stinking fast this uh, new macbook m1 chip is and i only have eight gigabytes of ram on this computer just eight gigabytes and this will give you an idea of how fast it works pretty stinking fast my other computer uh definitely would have taken three or four times as long so not necessarily an apple fan as far as functionality and everything because i'm so used to pc but I do like how fast it is. Okay, let's take a look and zoom in. And we could do a backwards and a forwards. So our, our stars look a little bit sharper, as does our galaxy in here. I do see still maybe a little bit of ringing. But um, like I said before with the DBE, Spending some time to fine-tune this is is really going to pay off for you. Um, I'm not going to go much further than that for today. Okay, deconvolution is done. Now let's do some denoising. I'll show you my denoising techniques. I've got another video that I showed on this, and those are going to be the same techniques that I use um, for denoising on these two images. So first up, we need to make a copy a luminance copy in essence and um, let's maximize that we need to apply a permanent stretch to this a little trick um, the typical way to do it is get your histogram transformation drag your screen transfer um, instance to it and then drag it over here but there's a script now utilities and um, it is delinear just click it 
and it stretches it. So, now what we need to do, we've got that stretched. We need to make another copy. Actually, let's label this. Um, we'll call it Loom Mask. Okay, make a copy. We're going to label this one T, uh, Loom TGV. So we're going to use TGV Noise. All right, let's go ahead and get the histogram transformation out. We are going to need it for this part. And we're also going to need the curves transformation. Okay, first up, this technique I learned from John Riesta on his website, johnriesta.com. He's got an excellent tutorial on denoising, and he goes into much more detail on the how and the why this stuff works. But we're going to create a mask for uh, TGV, and honestly, this is... This is the best denoising thing that I've seen. And a lot of the denoising processes that I've seen are uh, done after stretching your image. But this is all done before. Anyways, on the curves transformation, we want to actually make our image somewhat flat looking. And take some of the contrast out. So, put the output to somewhere around 0.2. And on that side, and then on this side, we're going to change our output to output to about 0.5 depending on how much contrast you want or don't want you can adjust that we're just going to drag and apply that to that so you can see it made the image look a little flatter a little grayer less contrast contrastiness is that a word contrastiness it is now I just said it um now we need to go to the histogram transformation and uh hit reset and track and let's bring the midpoint down where the peak of the histogram is at the 50% mark. And then apply this. All right, so we've got that nice and flattish looking. Um, now what we need to do is make a second copy. And we're going to label this Loom MMT because we're going to be denoising with multimedia transform. Now the only difference, the only thing we need to do to this one is basically... Instead of at 50%, we want to drag the histogram to around the set points, uh, 75% and apply that. All right, minimize that, minimize that. We're going to use these two things later on. Um, the next thing we need to do is to invert these. Now, some people like to apply the mask and then invert it with the mask invert option up here. I find that I forget to do that. So if I know that I have just inverted the image from the get-go... I usually don't screw that up. Um, we can minimize this. We won't be needing it for now. We can also minimize the loom mask because we're going to be referencing that in a minute. Now this TGV mask, we're going to want to go ahead and apply it. Okay. Pull this out of the way for a moment. Now uh, we can unshow the mask. And let's go ahead and show our previews again. And now let's grab the TGV denoise. Okay. I don't ever use RGBK mode, even on the RGB images. I've, I always use the CIE lab mode. All right, now we're not going to need chrominance because there's no color data in this image. Uh, but we are going to look at the lightness. What we want to do is check local support. And the support image is going to be our loom mask. So we've got the loom mask applied as local support in TGV denoise. And we have the TGV mask applied as an actual mask on the image. Now, according to John Riesta, basically what this does, it, it is, it's protecting the image uh, and the denoising from uh, a being applied too much in certain areas because we have that flat mask on there it applies it in a much more even sense uh, I don't know if you've ever used any of the other D, whether TGV or any of the other denoising options but sometimes it can make it look almost plasticky uh, when you do it that helps to prevent that when you're using TGV denoise okay let's look at a darker area first and we're going to go ahead and just apply this 
and see what happens. That's terrible, and that's because this initial default setting is much too high. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and lower this to around minus 5. Okay, and let's try it again. We're getting closer, but this is what I'm talking about with that plasticky look. See, that just doesn't look good. It looks plasticky. <laughs> um, so we want to avoid that. Let's go down another level. We want just a subtle change. We could probably go actually a little bit more. So instead of changing levels, now let's increase it here. Let's try four and see what happens. Just a subtle change. I'd say that probably looks good. Let's go ahead and look at our previews here. Try it on these and see. We want just a little bit of change, not too much. And let's finally look at this. You're going to see less of a change here because our mask is protecting these lighter areas. The lighter areas typically have less noise anyways. Yeah, I see a little bit there. Okay, I like that. Let's click um, on the main image there. And I like to change the iterations to 500. All right. Now let's take a look overall. I'm going to unhide the previews. We can go back and forth. It's very, very subtle. Um... You don't want to overdo TGVD noise. Now, I find that the MMT is going to do better overall. Um, but when we combine those two together, it works pretty nice. So let's save that for later. Remove the mask. Um, and now we're going to apply the MMT mask. Okay, we can kind of get an eye. Let's see what it looks like here. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and delete these previews. So what I like to do for MMT is create a copy of the whole image just by dragging down so that we can easily blink back and forth before we apply it permanently. Let's go ahead and get out MMT. Okay, uh, I don't know if any of you saw my last, my, my, not my last video, but my video on my favorite denoising technique, which was what I'm showing you now. I actually made a mistake. I don't know what I was thinking, but I, I gave instructions when I did this backwards. So today I'm going to show you how to do it properly. Um, in that last video, I did try to make a... Uh, a link to an unlisted video and also put it in the description trying to tell people the correct way to do it and that had made a mistake today I'll show you the right way to do it so we want eight layers we want it on dyadic and we're gonna click noise reduction on the first layer two layers we're gonna have it set to 10 and third layer we'll have it set to 7.5 for number four and number five, we'll have it set at five. Number six, we'll have it set to 2.5. And number seven and eight, we'll have it set at two. Okay. And what this is doing um, is, you know what? I'm gonna show you something really cool, okay. Let's go over to, okay, let's go over to um, extract wavelet layers. And we're going to use the same, I think that'll work, yeah. Um, eight layers, okay. So what this is going to show you is the different layers um, whenever we're using something like MMT or MLT, it shows you how the wavelet layers look and scale. So you could tell on like layer seven and and eight there, 
they're bigger objects. And as we go down the chain here, each layer is showing smaller and smaller objects. Now we're beginning to see a little bit more definition, the galaxy and the stars, but also starting to pick up some of the background noise. See, the lower we get, the more background noise that we get until finally we get down to the lowest layer and you can see all of that fine noise. Okay, so let me close all these. The reason why we use these layers like this is uh, l layer one and two has really fine noise. So we want the threshold to be really high so that it gets rid of more of that noise. While on these lower layers, we want the threshold to be even lower um, on seven and eight because we don't want to denoise those too much. So it's adjusting it, and that's um, why this is going to work the way that it does. Let me close that out. Uh, this is just a starting point, okay? Uh, some images I find that it works great with these settings initially. Sometimes I find that I can lower the threshold or lower the amount a little bit. But um, let's click our preview, kind of zoom in a little bit here. I think that's a good spot. And um, change that to luminance. I don't know if that matters when you're actually doing luminance. I don't think it does. But on our RGB data, when we do this denoising technique, uh, you're going to want to do um, chrominance and luminance separately. And I'll, I'll mention that when we get there. So let's apply this. And hit the back and forth. Oh, yeah. See how much smoother that looks? It looks so much better. Really, really smooth. All right. Now, I like that. Let's go ahead and click up here and apply it to the actual image now. Now, we can actually... Let's try applying it a second time and see if it just is overkill. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Mm, I don't know. As long as it hasn't affected the... Uh, yeah, I think it's a bit much. Um, I think it could benefit from a little bit more. So here's what we're going to do. Let's lower the amounts on all of these. Oh, let's just do 0.3. On, on um, all of them except some of the larger layers. And the reason why is because, like I said, we're going to get rid of some of the larger scale noise on those layers 6, 7, and 8. So we don't want to... You don't want to completely delete fine scale noise. It just makes your image look smooth and unnatural. That's what we're trying to avoid. So as I go down these, I'll just reduce the mount a little bit. Not a whole lot. Um, somewhere around there looks good. Okay. Now let's try that. Make sure I'm still on preview. Yep. Okay. And back and forth. Ah, there we go. Much better. It's just subtle. Just a little bit. But it does look clear. Let's go ahead and apply that to the loom image. There we go. Okay, now let's do the same exact things, but let's do it with the RGB data. Now, I'm not going to do bother doing deconvolution on this. I'm only using it for color. Um... That's a whole nother maybe tutorial for another day on uh, if you don't actually have luminance data. You can actually extract a luminance layer from the RGB and still do an LRGB combination. But like I said, that's a, a lesson for another day. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with this. Um, we don't want to use the same mask. We need to make new masks because the, the data is different between the two images. Um, let's get we, we do need to get a luminance extracted from this so the first thing in order to do this properly you want to use rgb working space the problem is if you extract the luminance data as is 
um, the color levels are not balanced. So we actually want them to be extracted with equal weight. So that's what this does. We slide all those to one, apply it. Then we can click, there's usually a shortcut on here, extract C-I-E-L component. Click that. And now we've got our luminance data here. I'll close out RGB working space. Okay, so we need to do what we did before. We can go to our script here and click delinear to make it permanent stretch. Then let's label this RGB loom mask. Make a copy and we're going to label it TGB. Now let's uh, let's go back to curves. Everything is still the same way we had it, so we can just drag and apply. Same with um, this. Just grab. Remember the TGV is going to be at fifty percent. Okay. Um, make another copy. Let's label this one MMT and bring this one up to about 0.75. Okay, and then don't forget to invert. You must invert. You must invert or it won't convert to a denoised image. That was a bad joke. Okay, uh, minimize these, drag them over here so they're out of the way. Um, all right, let's get started with the TGV. Open this back up. We need, don't forget when you do this to change your local support um, to the RGB uh, loom mask. So remember the, the luminance mask, extracted luminance mask from the RGB goes into local support and then the TGV mask, RGB TGV mask is going to be applied directly to the image. Okay, let's unshow that. Now for this, of course, like I said, I use the CIE lab mode. We do want to use chrominance, both of these. And like I said before, um, generally the settings are, are going to be too high. So I'll lower that to minus five. That's at minus six. Let's go ahead and lower this to minus six as well. Um, make previews in some different areas. And since this is color, let's do... Got some green over here, some purple and red over here. Make a couple in the dark areas. And then we can make some right in here. That ought to do. All right, let's um, apply and see what we've got. Move this over so you can see it. This is a, now it takes a little bit longer because we're it's doing both the luminance. Ooh. That's not good. That means that my chrominance level is too um, too much. I accidentally lowered it to minus four instead of to minus six. That's just why that happened. Let's apply this again, see what happens. Okay, much better, but that looks like crap. Um, way too much on the lightness side as well. And let's go ahead and put both of them at minus seven. That's the thing with Picket Sight. Everything's an experiment. You try it, you see what it looks like, you try it again, you fine tune it, get it where you want. Hey, that's looking better. I would say maybe still a bit much on the luminance, the lightness. Let's lower this down to two here. Chrominance, um, let's look. Let's try uh, bringing the levels up just a bit on the chrominance. Okay, try it again. Okay, yeah, just a bit of a subtleness there. Let's go ahead and double check it on the other previews just to see and make sure it doesn't look all screwy. 
Boom, baby. That looks moderately decent. <laughs> uh, okay, let's try it on this. Like I said but before, we're not really going to see a whole lot of difference because the lightness area is masked more than the dark areas. But we'll give it a go. Uh, I see just a little bit of change up here. Okay. I like that. Let's apply it to the whole image. Now, there's a line of thought. Honestly, I'm probably not experienced enough or experimented enough to know. Uh, some people say that with your RGB, you can actually go a, l a little heavier on denoising because your luminance data is what's going to be where your detail is. Um, I don't know. I've tried it both ways, denoising it like what seemed a little bit too much and then on a more regular, but I, I don't know if I ha have enough experience to tell the difference. So be back in just a minute when this is done. Okay. Let's see how this looks. Yep. Just a little bit there. I like it. Okay. Minimize that. Let's remove the mask. And delete the previews. So that, um, you know, I mean, you don't have to do that. It's just my preference because of the way that I like to do MMT. Make a preview of it for, for the MMT. Let's grab our MMT mask and apply it. It is inverted. That's what we want for that particular mask. It's just like the TGV one. And grab our MMT. Wonderfully, it is still... Um, not the same. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I've got to bring all these back up to, to one. That's my starting point with the thresholds that I showed you. Um, starting with the amount of one. As I do this, I'll tell you, most of the time with these settings for the threshold and the amount at one, it works good for the first round of denoising and then um, adjusting it a little bit lower the second time makes it uh, work on second and third iterations. According to, uh, you know, John Riesta's denoising techniques on this, this particular technique, you do not want to do the RGBK together. It's better if you do the luminance and the chrominance separately and doing the chrominance first seems to give a little bit better results. Now, I'm taking his word for it. I have not experimented with doing those things in different orders. Um, honestly, because I've followed his techniques and they work. They just simply work really well. So let's uh, zoom into an area with some chromatic um, noise there. And let's just apply this and see if it works. Okay, yep, I think it does. Looks just a little bit. Very subtle. You don't want to go, I mean, everything is subtle. We don't want to, uh, don't want to go too crazy on some of these. Now, I'm going to hit it with a second round. At, well, actually, first, I need to apply it to the actual image, not just the preview. Okay, let's go and apply a second round leaving the settings same as they are and just see what happens. Now, I think, here's my thinking in this. I think this works for galaxy photos. Um, when you're doing a nebula, especially one that takes up the whole entire image, I only do one instance of the chrominance uh, reduction because this really does kill your color in your image if you're not too careful. But with a galaxy, especially one as small as this one in my image, in my field of view, um, I don't think it's that big of a deal. So yeah, you can definitely tell. Let's go ahead and apply that second layer to that. Yep. Looking good. 
I think. Okay, now let's switch over to the luminance and apply the luminance. The luminance MMT noise reduction. That looks a bit, um, honestly, that looks a bit soft to me. It looks like it's done it just a bit too much, but this is the RGB data. So you know what? I think I'm going to leave it. Yeah, I think I'm going to leave it. What I'm going to do, though, um, after I apply this to the actual image here, I'm going to try to get rid of some of the bigger... Um, instead of the, I want to keep the fine noise that we have, but I want to get rid of some of the, the bigger blotches. And like I said, the, uh, the smaller layers deal with the smaller fine noise, while the bigger layers deal with the big stuff. So let's change the threshold on the small ones to a much, much lower number. 2.5 and let's do that with uh, with all of the smaller layers change them all to 2.5 and then starting with 6 and uh, 7 and 8 we're going to leave those where they're at and then let's just see what happens. Yeah. See, when we look at the image overall, some of those dark spots, uh, let's see if I can find some here. Some of those dark spots tend to disappear a little bit. But when we get close in, we're not losing a whole lot of that fine detail, although I think we are just a tad. So let's change the amounts on these um, to 0.5. Okay. Now let's try it. There we go. Much subtle, much more subtle, but it still helps denoise. I like that. Okay. Now let's apply it to the real thing. Um, I didn't do this before, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do it now. This is kind of a cool tip in case you didn't know. When you right click and look at your your history, you can go back, and we can actually go back before I did any denoise. So let's go back. And this is a good way to compare. Then drag a copy down here and then go back to the original, load your history, and go back to where it was. Now I can compare what it was uh, before and after. And then to match the, the sizes here of the windows, I click and drag here to see that little square icon. So now this image whoops, is not matched because I didn't maximize it. Try that again. There we go. There we go. Before and after. So, there you go. Um, this heavier denoising, I think it works fine because I've got this little tiny galaxy here. When you've got an image with a larger galaxy or a larger nebula, be very gentle with your denoising techniques because you'll kill your detail and you'll kill your color. Now that's why it's good um, to do everything on the same image as much as you can so that any of that stuff you can go back and redo some stuff if you need to. Okay, let's, uh, let's remove the mask here and go on to the next thing. Okay, so this next process that we're going to be doing is a script called the HS, Repaired HSV Separation. Now... What this does is, if you've ever stretched your image, especially if you're using something like ArcSign Stretch, which I do use, um, you'll notice that sometimes there can be weird artifacts in the center of the stars, and Repaired HSV Separation Script can often fix that and prevent that from happening. I've found in some of my images it doesn't always work, but I always at least try it. 
um, your default settings um, are usually repair levels around 0.5 max repairs around 16 um, I I double that to 32 and kind of lower uh, this a little bit I find that I think on this image it worked best for that um, I'm gonna go ahead and reset that though so you, what you're gonna want to do is click V no repairs and then you can adjust these things like I said um, I'm gonna do how I had it set before uh, most of the time though I find that the default settings work pretty good but click OK it's gonna create a bunch of copies and stuff you don't have to mess with any of them all you need to do is go to all of the processes and go to um, channel combination select the HSV button here and then usually it automatically selects RGBH RGBSV and then it should select the RGB unrepaired V and then hit the global to apply it and it will create a new image all of these we can close out now on the unrepaired V it's going to tell you it has not been saved and blah 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 yes go ahead and close that just don't accidentally close your RGB um, data I've done that before and that really sucks <laughs> so especially if you're an idiot and haven't saved it alright let's go ahead and stretch this actually I've got uh, the screen stretch saved here now you're not going to notice it here so um, we've now we can go ahead and close out that RGB now what I like to do before I do that since this one has all of my history and I made a new image that I'm going to be working on I like to rename this to RGB uh, ORG or original and this will be now my new RGB that I'm working on Oop. RGB okay now let's do some color calibration and background neutralization for background neutralization we need to select and, and make a preview of a small area of background so uh, that it can work you don't want to get any nebulosity you don't want to get any part of the galaxy you want to try to find an empty space in the background area I'd say that this looks pretty good good right here okay process uh, background neutralization I find the default settings work just fine except we are going to want to select the reference image as our RGB preview one and then drag and apply and there you go the image is finished we're done no just kidding let's stretch this back out and you'll notice that the uh, the stretch of course it's um, because we've changed some of the other things it's gonna look a little wonky okay now we need to open up our color calibration process there is another one that actually does both of those combined the background neutralization and the color calibration is called uh, PCC um, or photometric color calibration uh, I have mixed results with that I find it's a lot more fiddly sometimes than 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 it's worth um, it can get some good results but I don't know using background neutralization and color calibration just seems to be more consistent for me so we are going to want to uh, select a background reference which we can use the same exact preview that we used before and for white reference if you leave that blank it uses the whole image but if you're using a if you're if you've imaged a galaxy that has a white core or mostly white as a white reference then you can actually make another preview and select that as your white reference so I'm gonna go ahead and do that and select RGB preview 2 and the other default settings work good most of the time okay 
Now to prevent this tutorial video from being too long, I'm going to make a part two video after this. But before we go, I wanted to show you one thing real quick. Oh, would you look at that? Like and subscribe. Was that too cheesy? Yeah probably anyways it would really help me out if you hit the like button and if you haven't already subscribe the next video part two will be out just a couple days after i publish this so be on the lookout for